This is a video lesson on biofuels. Biodiesel will be used as a case study and we will be making and testing biodiesel to check for its efficiency as an alternative fuel source. This video lesson assumes the audience has a basic understanding of general thermal energy concepts, however these will be briefly reviewed. It also includes basic organic chemistry concepts as they relate to fuel sources. This lesson plan takes about 2-3 to 45 minute class periods to complete. Narration and development of this lesson plan was done by Derek Smesser and is a product of the Boat of Knowledge in the Science Classroom Project at Ohio University. Acknowledgement is given to the National Science Foundation for funding of this project. So what exactly are biofuels? Most of us are intimately familiar with the use of petrol gasoline as fuel for use in our vehicles and machinery. We fill our cars with petrol gasoline at the pump and worry about increasing gas prices which seem to change on a daily basis. All of our infrastructure is based on the use of personal vehicles for transportation, which would not be possible otherwise without the help of gasoline. But did you know that petroleum is not the only form of fuel? In fact, any material which stores chemical potential energy can be used in some way, shape, or form as a source of fuel. Think about burning wood, like at a bonfire. The heat you feel from the fire is due to chemical energy being released by the combustion of the wood in the presence of oxygen. The wood will continue to burn until all of the chemical energy is expended or until the temperature is no longer able to sustain the reaction, at which point heat is no longer given off and the fire goes out. Think about it. Could you reignite the ash at the bottom of a fire pit? The burning of wood is probably the earliest example of humans utilizing a fuel source for their own benefit and is also an example of a biofuel and a renewable source of energy. Pause this video now and see if you can come up with other examples of fuel. Try to separate your suggestions into what one might consider conventional fuel and biofuel. By the end of this le lesson, you should understand what biofuels are and how they compare with petrol fuels. Most of our consumable energy is produced through the use of non-renewable resources. These graphs from the U.S. Energy Information Administration, or EIA for short, illustrate the breakdown of renewable energy consumption in the U.S. by source. The EIA is a government-funded agency under the Department of Energy and compiles data from multiple sources on energy use within the United States. The graph on the left-hand side compares renewable energy sources and includes hydroelectric, wind, solar, and biomass sources. The biomass group considers biofuels, wood, and also waste from municipal and agricultural sectors. As you can see, Renewable energy use in the U.S. has been steadily growing since 1950, and only recently have we seen the introduction of wind and solar technology. However, today the U.S. is still mostly reliant on fossil fuel energy, using nearly 20 times the amount of fossil fuels as renewable, and 10 times that of nuclear and renewable sources combined. From the graph on the right, fossil fuel use in the mid-1900s grew nearly exponentially until about 1973, around which time, OPEC proclaimed an oil embargo against the United States for support of Israel in a war against Arab nations. This ultimately raised the price of a barrel of oil from $3 to $12 once the embargo was ceased in 1974. It appears that nuclear and biomass energy gained some traction at this time in an effort to decrease U.S. dependence on foreign oil. In order to understand biofuel and other fuels, a little bit of organic chemistry goes a long way. Organic chemistry is any chemistry which involves the carbon atom. Because of carbon's unique ability to bond with four other atoms, it is present in all forms of life on Earth. When a molecule is comprised entirely of carbon and hydrogen atoms, it is ap aptly called a hydrocarbon. Typically, hydrocarbons make excellent fuel sources. They are relatively stable in long chains, are abundant in nature, and easily combust to carbon dioxide and water, which are stable end products. When combusted, hydrocarbons release a net amount of energy, which can then be utilized to generate energy in the form of work or heat. You may already know about methane, ethane, propane, and butane. These compounds are known as alkanes, with methane being the simplest example. Alkanes are saturated carbon chains, meaning all the carbon-hydrogen and carbon-carbon bonds are single bonds. Methane, ethane, protane, propane, and butane are all gases at room temperature and are all used as sources of fuel. 
Methane is known as natural gas and is commonly commonly used in homes for heating purposes. Propane is commonly used for grilling, and butane is a common component in disposable lighters. Alkanes with more than four carbon atoms are typically liquids or solids at room temperature. Usually, the higher the carbon content, the more likely the alkane is to be a solid. Another class of hydrocarbons present in fuel are aromatics. These are cyclic hydrocarbons with a ring-like structure and are highly flammable and stable. They are toxic compounds and are persistent in the environment due to their stability. A few examples of aromatic compounds are benzene, toluene, and xylene. As a general rule of thumb, lower molecular weight hydrocarbons have lower boiling points and higher molecular weight hydrocarbons have higher boiling points. This explains why the lower molecular weight alkanes are gases at room temperature and is also an important property to consider during crude oil refinement. Where does gasoline and crude oil come from anyway? And what does petroleum mean? While these may seem like silly questions that we should probably all know by now, it is important to understand the origins of crude oil so that we can compare its use as a fuel to other alternative sources. We will see later that common fuels like gasoline and diesel are very similar in structure to biofuels. For now, we will briefly discuss fossil fuels and crude oil. To begin with, a fossil fuel is any source of energy which is accumulated in the subsurface from prehistoric plant and animal deposits. Contrary to the image, fossil fuels are predominantly made up of ancient dead algae and zooplankton. Fossil fuels include crude oil, coal, and natural gas. Crude oil, also known as petroleum, is the end result of millions of years of thermal and pressure-induced decomposition of organic material. It is typically extracted from subsurface reservoirs in the liquid form, but can also be stripped from solid sources as well. Crude oil is composed of various hydrocarbons of differing molecular weight and is generally useless in its natural state. It must be first refined before it can be used as an energy source. Gasoline isn't actually a single molecule, but is a mixture of lower molecular weight hydrocarbons, typically between 5 and 12 carbon atoms long. Gasoline, as well as other fuel mixtures, including diesel, are refined from crude oil in a process known as fractional distillation. In the fractional distillation process, crude oil is fed through the bottom of the distillation column, and different hydrocarbon mixtures are removed at different points within the column. The process takes advantage of the different boiling points of the hydrocarbons comprising the crude oil. The short video you are about to see details the distillation process and the various uses of each end product. It may surprise you to learn about all of the different products of crude oil which you use in your daily lives. The thing about crude oil is it's crude. Even if you could get that stuff into your petrol tank and somehow set fire to it, it wouldn't provide the instant explosive power that internal combustion craves. To be honest, you'd be better off coating your driveway with it than driving with it. To become usable fuel, it has to be refined. So at the heart of the refinery lies the laboratory, headed by Joyce Bussey. It's up to Joyce's lab to supervise the process of turning the crude oil into usable products. Crude oil in this state is not very useful at all. If you put this in your tank, you'd be sorry because it wouldn't go anywhere. The trouble with crude oil is it contains a mix of hydrocarbons, each of which has a different number of carbon atoms. The hydrocarbons are different in weight. The lightest is propane, while the heaviest is used to make asphalt. Extracting petrol from this mix is a formidable challenge, and it requires one heck of a chemistry set to do it. The most important part of the plant is this. Like a moonshine still as tall as a cathedral, this is where the crude is separated. Heated to over 370 degrees Celsius, it's pumped into the base of the tower. And like steam from a kettle, the vapor rises. 
As it cools, the molecules condense. The heavy asphalt and tar at the bottom, while lighter molecules, including diesel, jet fuel and petrol, continue rising until they too condense and can be siphoned off. This finally brings us to the main focus of this lesson, biofuels. In the broadest sense, biofuel is a term used to describe energy stored as biomass. Unlike petrol fuels, biofuels utilize energy from recently living organisms instead of energy derived from crude oil reservoirs where carbon has been trapped underground for millennia. As a result, the production of biofuels is considered to be partly carbon neutral. To give you an idea of why this is, consider corn as an example. Corn stock used for bioethanol production has grown in large quantities. Because corn is a plant, it utilizes carbon dioxide, water, and light energy to grow. In doing so, the corn plant builds biomass in the form of carbohydrates, most notably as sugars. The plant is then harvested, and its sugar is used in biofuel production. The biofuel is then used in vehicles and finally combusted back into the atmosphere as CO2 and water. If only biofuel is used for energy purposes, this, cy this cycle will continue on. In other words, it would be a zero-sum game. Combustion of fossil fuels is not considered carbon neutral because the carbon dioxide released from this process cannot be removed and reused in a similar way. In other words, it is a net release of CO2 to the atmosphere. As you can see, this process is deemed carbon neutral because any CO2 released into the atmosphere is accounted for in the growth of the feedstock. Of course, as it is with all processes, even if only biofuel were used, this process would still be imperfect. Can you think of any ways in which biofuel production may cause problems? Pause the video and try to compare, the con compare and contrast the advantages and disadvantages of using biofuels versus petroleum-based fuels. Biofuels are not a particularly new concept. With the invention of the diesel engine in the late 1890s, peanut oil could be used in lieu of gasoline to power an engine. In a 1912 speech, Rudolf Diesel, inventor of the diesel engine, was quoted as saying, The use of vegetable oils for engine fuels may seem insignificant today, but such oils may become, in the course of time, as important as petroleum in the coal tar products of the present time. It has only been recently, however, that biofuels are emerging as an alternative source of energy which may compete in a consumer market against traditional petrol fuels. Methods of synthesizing biofuels using biomass materials such as cellulose, plant starches, or oil feedstocks are becoming more efficient as science and technology progresses. Ethanol, or ethyl alcohol, is most commonly associated with alcoholic drinks and is commonly referred to as grain alcohol. Bioethanol can be thought of as a biofuel equivalent to petrol gasoline, but it has less energy per mass than gasoline, around 60% of the strength of gasoline to be exact. This means that an equivalent amount of bioethanol will not produce as much energy as petrol gasoline on a mass-to-mass -mass basis. Production of bioethanol is relatively straightforward and employs the same techniques that the spirit industry does to produce liquor. First, the feedstock, in this scenario molasses, is added to a fermentation chamber where yeast converts sugars to ethyl alcohol. Depending on the feedstock used, enzymes might need to be added in order to break down long-chain sugars into simpler sugars. Yeast can utilize simpler sugars more efficiently, so this step is necessary to ensure proper conversions of sugars to alcohol and within a reasonable amount of time. Next, the resulting mixture, which is essentially beer, is pumped to a series of distillation columns to separate the residual particles in water from the alcohol. The end result is a highly pure ethanol product, about 95% ethanol by weight. Finally, the ethanol is pumped through molecular sieves to remove excess water and any impurities which may have passed through the distillation step. Condensate water from the distillation is recycled back to the head of the plant to conserve water and waste products from the unconverted molasses may be used as food for livestock or burn to reduce energy for the plant. Biodiesel, on the other hand, is a biofuel equivalent of diesel fuel and is produced in a reaction known as transesterification. 
vegetable or animal oil is reacted with methanol using a base catalyst to produce biodiesel and glycerol. Glycerol is a material used in the soap making process. The video you are about to see details the steps involved in the creation of biodiesel from waste oil. My name is Brent Baker. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Tri-State Biodiesel. We've been in existence about six years and we've been collecting cooking oil in the city for uh, about almost four years. We're here at our headquarters in Hunts Point, Bronx. This is our administrative offices as well as our rendering facility and truck depot. So this is the place where all the cooking oil that we collect in the city and in the region uh, gets consolidated and cleaned up and then shipped out for biodiesel manufacturing. We leave the office about 6 in the morning, we go to our first restaurant, we take the hose off the truck, run them down to the basement, sometimes we carry the oil upstairs. We'll suck it up with the hose, then we go to our next stop and do the same process, and we do that all day long. Then we head back to the um, Bronx, and we got a big tank that holds like 6,000 gallons. We have three of them tanks, and we dump them into there. We take all the oil, because everything, every oil makes a good biodiesel. This has a longer process of cleaning it out. Once they're done with the shift, they'll uh, they'll come in here and uh, hook up to our incoming uh, filtration system and load this uh, raw cooking oil and fats through our system and into our raw oil storage tank. Filtering out bits of French fries and chicken bones and. Whatever got into our truck, it's all organic solids, so it's actually good stuff for the mix of some fertilizers. And we process somewhere around uh, six or 8,000 gallons a day here at this facility. It works great as a heating oil. I mean, it's really the, the easiest application in the world. So we take this, this waste product that at one point was either animal feed or landfill, and we're making a, a, a sustainable fuel, something that Instead of wasting it, throwing it away, we're making something that has a second life, a second use. Tri-State goes out and they collect the oil. Tri-State then will load that oil into a truck. That truck, which today we're using Hart, Hart will go and pick up the oil from Tri-State, deliver that to Northern Biodiesel. Our guys grab a sample, we test the quality, ensure that it is what it needs to be, then we just bring it into one of our holding tanks. Feedstock has a value based on what's in it. So the first thing we do is water testing and a free fatty acid testing. As you take any oil or animal fat and you cook it, you heat it up, by default that oil will start to develop these free fatty acids. Those free fatty acids actually turn into a soap on us in production. So what we want to do is we want to eliminate that or have as small amount as possible. We take alcohol and our catalyst, we combine that with the oil. The oil and the alcohol undergo a chemical reaction in the presence of a catalyst. That oil it actually will drop off glycerin and will be replaced with an alcohol. Our alcohol is a methanol, which makes it a methyl ester. That's the chemical name for biodiesel. From that point, it goes into a reactor vessel where that reaction takes place. The biodiesel then, free of that glycerin, will come off the top, we'll hit it with another 10% of what we need to force the reaction to completion, make sure we have a really nice, clean reaction. That reaction happens on a smaller scale in another reactor vessel. From that, we go into all quality. The quality consists of making sure that we get a really good wash, which removes a lot of impurities, metals, etc. And then the next step is a distillation. The distillation removes all of your free water, free methanol. At that point, you have a really nice, clean, spec quality biodiesel. Once it's in our finished holding tanks, we can we can either fill rail cars for customers or we can fill trucks. We, we can accommodate any customer, big or small. We wanted to make a, a New York connection for biodiesel. All of that feedstock is from New York. All the biodiesel is made in New York. And all that biodiesel goes back and is consumed in New York. And that's when we come back to that sustainability, that localized focus on, on what we want to do here. And that's collect and supply uh, our customers a New York product. We work with uh, Tri-State Biodiesel, uh, Northern Biodiesel, and Ultra Green Energy Services in Chicago. Uh, we, have, we wear three different hats. We own the uh, transportation, the bulk transportation company called Hot Trucking Corp. And Ultra Green Energy Services has hired Hot Trucking Corp to pick the uh, raw product up, the yellow grease, and bring it back to New High Park. We also own New High Park Oil Terminal. New High Park Oil Terminal is hired by Ultra Green Energy Services to offload that yellow grease and pump it into a, a rail car. When the product comes back as uh, biodiesel, it is brought into New High Park Oil Terminal and our other company, Hot Petroleum, which sells heating oil and biofuels to uh, the consumer uh, gets involved at that point. 
the product is loaded into a separate tank. It's maintained at a certain temperature so that when it's uh, blended with either diesel fuel or with heating oil, uh, we don't have to be worried about any, any type of product gelling up. It's all computerized, activated. So if a driver comes in and he punches into the computer, which is called an AccuLoad, he'll punch in uh, what type of blend he's looking for. It blends, takes a certain amount of product from one tank and another tank, which would be 20% biofuel and 80% uh, heating oil, and gives us uh, a B20 mix. At that point, once the truck is loaded, he just uh, goes about what his normal uh, deliveries would be for the day and just delivers it like he would be delivering regular heating oil. We sell a lot of uh, B20 heating oil. That's our main uh, retail fuel business. It's 20% biodiesel mixed with 80% uh, number two. We don't have anybody screaming at us that seals are blowing up. We don't have any uh, problems with gelling. People are scared, you know, hey, if I change, you know, my, I want to have my heater working. Uh, you know, it's very important to keep my family warm. And so people are scared and, and that's legitimate. But the fact of the matter is that if those folks would talk to any of our customers or any of the customers of the other uh, several companies in the area that sell BioHeat every day, none of those customers are complaining at all. For this lab activity, you will be making biodiesel from virgin vegetable oil using a transesterification reaction. Split into groups of three to four, the oil will be mixed with a measured amount of methanol using potassium hydroxide as a catalyst. Going over the equation for this reaction, the fatty acid chains of the vegetable oil in blue are displaced with a hydroxyl group from the methanol in orange to create the glycerol product on the far right hand side. The methyl group from the methanol in green attaches to the fatty acid group of the vegetable oil in blue to create biodiesel. This can be thought of as cutting the fingers off of the hand, the fingers being the fatty acid chains in blue, and the hand being the glycerin backbone in red. Heat is required to speed this reaction and decrease the viscosity of the fluid to help with mixing. Vegetable oil and methanol will not mix together spontaneously, so this step is required to force interaction between the reactants in order for the reaction to proceed. After two days of settling, the glycerol should have separated out of the biodiesel. It will look somewhat like the middle jar in the right hand picture on the bottom of the screen. The end product is a less dense layer of biodiesel on top of a denser layer of glycerol. Stoichiometrically, three methyl methanol molecules are required to react with one vegetable oil molecule, producing three biodiesel molecules and one glycerol molecule. For more detailed instructions, read the associated handout. As an aside, this may be found with the accompanying 5E. When creating biodiesel, you'll be working with some nasty chemicals. Methanol is highly flammable and toxic and should always be handled with gloves, goggles, and a lab coat while under a fume hood. Potassium hydroxide is a strong base and is hygroscopic, meaning it pulls moisture from its surroundings. This can cause caustic burns. If your teacher does not pre-mix the potassium hydroxide and methanol beforehand, make sure to wear proper lab equipment while handling. Just remember to be aware of the dangers involved at all times and don't play around with this stuff. Pause the video on this slide while conducting the lab as a safety reminder. Heating value is the specific energy content of a fuel and is a parameter which reflects the efficiency of a fuel. In other words, this is the theoretical amount of energy a given amount of fuel can supply upon combustion. It is often reported in energy output per unit volume or mass. This is BTUs per gallon in parallel units and megajoules per kilogram in SI units. The BTU is a unit which is a bit tricky to understand but it refers to the energy required to raise one pound of water by one degrees Fahrenheit. So for example, if a fuel has a heating value of five BTUs per gallon, one gallon of that fuel would be able to generate enough heat energy to raise the temperature of one pound of water by five degrees Fahrenheit. Generally, fuels with higher heating values require less mass to produce the same energy output as those with lower heating values. 
This table lists various fuels with their respective heating values. Note discrepancies between heavier and lighter fuels, as well as between biofuels and petrofuels. Why might this be? Pause the video here to discuss any differences and speculate on reasons for these discrepancies. Typically, heavier fuels will have higher heating values than lighter fuels. Biofuels will generally have lower heating values than their petrol counterparts. But, heavier fuels will also require more energy to kickstart combustion. This is why gasoline vehicles cannot run diesel fuel. This relationship does not appear to hold for liquefied natural gas and hydrogen, but in order for these gases to exist in a liquid state, they must be held under pressure. Interestingly, these liquefied gases have a low heating value on a volume basis, which suggests that you would need a larger holding tank to take advantage of these fuels anyway. For the second part of this lab activity, you will be testing your biodiesel using a makeshift calorimeter to determine its experimental heating value. You will then compare your value with a published range of heating values for biodiesel. Hopefully by now, you should be able to observe two distinct layers in your biodiesel jar. The bottommost layer is glycerin, and the topmost is biodiesel. Pipette or decamp the biodiesel off the top of the glycerin to a new test tube. You will now test the fuel in your test tubes to see how useful they are as a fuel source. Calorimetry is the measurement of energy content through indirect means. For this lab, your biofuel will be combusted and used to heat water. Given the published value for the specific heat capacity of water, a temperature change due to heating water with a fuel source, and the total mass of water being heated, you can find out how much energy, how much heat energy a given fuel source has imparted to the water. Knowing how much fuel was lost during combustion by measuring the weight of fuel before and after, you can calculate the heating value of your biodiesel by dividing the heat energy given off by the mass of biodiesel lost in combustion. We will now look at how to set up the makeshift calorimeter. This calorimeter can be set up similarly to how you might heat water in a flask over a Bunsen burner. It is suggested that this activity be done outside or under a fume hood as the combustion reaction gives off a moderate amount of smoke. First, add 200 milliliters of tap water to an Erlenmeyer flask and place this on a ring stand as shown. Measure the initial temperature of the water using a thermometer and calculate the mass of water using the density volume relationship for water. Rig up an aluminum foil apron around the rim of the ring stand so that a flame may be channeled directly to the flask. This will mitigate heat loss to the atmosphere. Add about 20 milliliters of your biofuel into a container. A small pop can cut in half works well for this. Place a gas wick into a pop into the pop can container and measure the combined weight of the container with wick and biofuel. Light the wick and allow fuel to burn for 10 minutes underneath the flask. After 10 minutes of heating, extinguish the flame. Measure the final temperature of water and the final weight of the container with wick and remaining biofuel. The difference between your initial and fire measurement will be the biofuel loss to combustion. Finally, calculate the heating value of your fuel and compare this with the published value. Discuss any flaws in this calorimeter setup and any potential improvements. Pause the video here to conduct the experiment. 